Hello tonight. I'm so sorry. <coughs> Hello tonight. Ah, sorry. Hello. Pause. Tonight. Rutland Witend. Oh, dear. Next. Hello and welcome to Rutland Week. End. What? End! Oh, okay. <laughs> Next. Um, hello. Um, um, um. Next! Oh. Hello and welcome to Rutland Weekend Television. Terrific! Hello and welcome to Rutland Weekend Television. Hello and welcome to Rutland Weekend Television. Hello and welcome to Rutland Weekend Television. Can you say anything else? What? Can you say anything else? Yes, when Scus Marcus Boy. All right, all right, all right. Go away, go away, go away. Whose Swedish girlfriend was that? Next! Hello. Television. Yes. Oh, oh, right. go on, go away, go away. Oh, this is terrible. Look, look, look here, Betty, why don't you do it? Me? Yes. Oh, I couldn't. Yeah, of course you could. It's easy. But, but I'm too plain. Nonsense. All you have to do is take off your glasses, let it... Oh, you're right, you're far too plain. Look here, why don't you try it anyway? Just try it. Good evening and welcome to Rutland Weekend Television. We hope you'll enjoy our first programme, tonight's drama. Court is adjourned. Cheer up, Prentice. Twenty years isn't too bad. Yeah, but it was my first offence. Well, I mean, it could have been more, you know. Oh, yes, oh, yes, I see what you mean, yeah. I mean, let's look on a bright side. It's only you who's going to be doing it and not me. That's true. You know, some of the prisons are nice and clean. There's plenty of pals, plenty of ping-pong, you know. I, I envy you. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, oh, thank you very much for being my lawyer. Not at all. It's been most interesting having a go at it, you know. I mean, I'm only sorry I could have got you off with less. Oh, well, never mind. You put that judge in his place. Yeah, well, he had it coming to him, didn't he? Arrogant sod silence in court. Who do you think he was talking to? Y you don't think he might have taken it out on me? Oh, no. Well, yeah, he might have had it on five years. Uh, just the five? Well, oh. yeah. I shall always remember that. You are a stupid old hemorrhoidal bewigged twit and you are not worthy to judge my client. Very good. Mind you, I don't think you should have called him comrade. No? No, no. I mean, some of these judges are very touchy. Mate or squire is fine, but comrade is a bit too lefty. Oh, I see. Well, I shall know better next time. Yeah, that's true. In 20 years' time or so, you'll know much better. Yes. Will, will you come and visit me? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll drop by every seven or eight years, you oh, know. Oh, thank you very much. Not at all. Only it is a bit of a bit of a sweat, you know, getting over to... Uh, Wandsworth. Uh, to Wandsworth from my part of Hampstead, so I might not come. Oh, but thank you very much, all the same. And, 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 and may I say, Mr Slater, it's been a great pleasure working for you. Not at all, not at all. I mean, I'm only sorry you were caught. You know, I mean, perhaps it was my fault. Oh, no, no, your plan was brilliant. Well, yes, it was. I mean, and I've got the money, so that's one consolation for you, isn't it? Yes, yes. Um, will you still be around when I get out? No, no, no. It's been a bit of a sweat for me, you know, organising this robbery, hiding in the background, making sure you're arrested and so on. So I think I'll retire into the sun. Oh, retire? Yeah. Oh, congratulations. Oh, thank you very much indeed, Prentice. I mean, you're a very kind-hearted soul. That's rather why I chose you to be fall guy in the first place. Um, what exactly is a fall guy? Uh, well, it's just, uh, just a legal term, but, you know, I looked at you, I thought, simple, happy Scotsman. What he needs is a change of scene. Well, I've certainly got that. <laughs> yeah, well, glad to see you've still got your sense of humour with you. I well, mean, uh, well, you're going to need it, aren't you? If you can't find something to laugh about, where are you? Probably in prison. Uh, yes, you're right there. Well, so long, Mr Slater. Well, bye-bye, Prentice. Oh, and uh, thanks very much for not squealing. What, you mean when you hit me? No, no, I mean for not telling the authorities about me. Why should I do that? Oh, uh, well, to get off with a lighter sentence, you know. Oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> no, well, you wouldn't. <laughs> you mean if I told them about you, I wouldn't have to do so long? Uh, well, probably, yes. Well, in order, in order to avoid doing 20 years, all I have to do is to tell them about you? Well, in theory, yes. And, and they'd probably let me off? Uh, well, they'd, they'd have to, yeah. <laughs> Warder! I think I should warn you that if you did do that, I should have to kill you. 
After you come out? Yes. In 20 years' time? Well, yes. I see. I have the choice either of doing 20 years or, on the other hand, getting all the money, your charming lady Gwen, your house, your car, and retiring into the sun. Yes, certainly a difficult choice. Warder! So morality prevailed in the end. Slater was arrested, tried, and given 15 years. Prentice appealed successfully, received a conditional discharge, and was run over on the way home. But this is... But this is all... But this is all... Oh, next! Betty, look, I'm sorry, you'll have to do the rest of it. Okay, so Ray. do it all. John. Oh, sorry. But this is all part of life's rich pattern. Well, now on Rutland Weekend, it's time for tonight's documentary. This man is suffering from what was until recently considered an incurable disease. However, due to an enormous new breakthrough, scientists now believe that people like him can be helped and that his sickness can be completely cured. For this man is in love. Uh, in this clinic, we have established beyond all reasonable evidence that love is in fact a sickness. Uh, it is a disease a dirty virus which people catch uh, from other people and pass on. Uh, it is extremely contagious and spreads very, very quickly uh, from kissing and touching and putting the tongue into the mouth and so on. Uh, but we have now isolated the little pest and can execute it. David, what are you here for? Well, I caught love. How? Well, from this girl, Maureen. Where? In bed. One minute it was, well, hey, you know, and the next I started reading poetry and gazing at the moon and buying chocolates and holding hands and that. David's solution was drastic. He went to see his family doctor. Did it help when you told the doctor that you were in love? No, he told the police. And the police came and took you away? Yes, in a black mariah. What happened? Well, they were all very nice about it. They said they'd all been in love, and the death sergeant said he'd been in love four times, twice almost fatally. You have to put people who are in love in hospital because they're sick. Otherwise, other people will catch it. Nasty, filthy little disease. There are over a hundred patients at this new Royal Free Love Hospital. Here in this ward, they're all in the grip of the early stages of love. We do what we can to help them. I give him some sonnets every hour, and he likes a little Mantovani. But I don't touch them. The most severe cases are kept in isolation wards, and some even have to be operated on. I'm uh, taking this chap along to be operated on. Uh, we have diagnosed him as incurably in love with Betty from Redditch. Uh, he has not responded to treatment, drugs or threats, so consequently we're going to try and operate on him. What are you going to do? Oh, we're just going to open him up, take a little look around, you know. Where? In the theatre. No, where are you going to open him up? Oh, anywhere we come to, you know, we played a bit by ear. Isn't that dangerous? Oh, no, 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 we're in no danger. The theatre is very strong. No, him. Oh, him? Oh, yes, he's in great danger. Oh, but which is worse, that I open him up and play around with his insides, or that he suffers from love? It's worse that you open him up. You think so? Yes. You're sick? You want to stop right on you? No. My advice to you, young man, is don't mess around with doctors. Have him certified as a loony in case we need to keep him here for observation. Hello. I'm the new voiceover on this documentary. Martin, the voiceover before me, is now assisting Dr. Cripper with his inquiries. So I'm here to complete the voiceover on this programme. <coughs> One of the more unusual aspects of Dr. Crippen's treatment of love sickness is staff nurse Sutton. It's her job to try and get the patient's minds onto healthier things.
staff nurse Sutton used to work in a sort of hospital in Soho, but she's now a respected medical practitioner who does lecture tours and stag nights at medical schools and has been the centrefold in The Lancet. What exactly is she doing in there? She's giving him some special treatment. What sort of treatment? Um, medical treatment. Does it hurt? A bit. But it's nice, really. The casualty department at the Royal Free Love Hospital is for outpatients who have fallen in love while watching Richard. television. Oh, Richard! This woman is delirious about Richard Baker. This man has become obsessed with Peter West. Oh, Peter. <laughs> oh, it's horrible sometimes when they bring them in. Only last week, one poor chappie had fallen in love on the motorway. He was head over heels when they got to him. And the week before that, we had the Donny Osmond scare, when 400 young girls were brought in from a local school suffering from Donny Osmond. What did you do? Well, we try and warn them of the horrible side effects of Donny Osmond, but no sooner are they cured of that than they catch Gary Glitter. Well, uh, we seem to have lost the camera there. Uh, it uh, seems to have run away. It rather looks as though it's going to the seaside. Uh, <coughs> well, uh, when we get the camera back, we'll continue with the Ruttle story. Meanwhile, it's time for episode three of the history of the entire world. What's that? That's a fly. A fly? What's it do? Well, it sort of flies. Oh, does it bite anybody? No, not really. Well, what's the point of it? No, it's nice, that's all. Better than your vulture. Oh, are you finished them wasps yet? No, I can't get these antlers to stick on. Well, forget the antlers, just give it wings. Wings? That's a good idea. These wheels are dreadful. Oh, we'll never get this lot finished in time. Why didn't you make the wombat like you were supposed to, instead of mucking about with flies? They're nice. Hello. Oh, hello. Guess what I just made? A sperm whale. No, nah, that was yesterday. Well, what then? A swallow. A swallow? What does that do? It eats flies. It eats my flies? What do you mean it eats your flies? Oh, I've just made these flies. There's a bloke next door already made flies. Oh, well, that's nice, isn't it? That's typical, that is. Anyway, that's not a fly, that's a hornet, you nasty-minded little angel. Oh, lay off. Fred? Yeah? Every time I screw the legs on the horse, the back comes up. Well, leave it as it is and call it a camel. All right, oh. Hey, look out, supervisor. Everything going all right, lads? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Gabriel. What's that dreadful smell? It's snobby. You can't get those fish to breathe and they're starting to go off. Oh, throw them in a bucket of water or something. Water? That's a good idea. Hey, Nobby. Yeah? What if we were to stick those fish in water? Well, they'd drown. Not if it was to saw the legs off, they wouldn't. Whoever heard a legless fish? Is there any way we can get an extension, Mr. Gabriel, an extra day? Oh, I'm sorry, lad. Six days it is. The seventh is for resting. It's a union thing. Uh, I never knew we had a union. Uh, something Satan's stirring up. Bloody shop stewards. Oh, well, he's got a point, you know. I mean, last night I had to finish off an alligator because Nobby was called off to work on Japan. Then I had to design a lizard, put a tuck in a frog, and then I had to come up with a decent colour for zebras. They were supposed to be pink. Black and white stripes. Well, I was tired. Mr. Gabriel? Yeah? You know, like, eternity is forever. Yeah? Well, how come we've only got six days to do this job? We're hoping for another order. 
Mr. Gobel, has he got that man started yet? No, he's going to breathe in his nostrils after lunch. Yeah. I don't think that man's a good idea. Mr. Gabriel, I've got an idea about that man. What is it? Well, I thought we could take one of his ribs out, see? Knock through and make good and, and, and make a woman for him. What's that? Well, I'll tell you. Something for him to play with. To play with? Well, what would they do? Well, I'll tell you, listen. We never get away with that. No. What else do they do? Well, I think I'll make him a nice little snake to keep him company. So it was that Angel Robinson was responsible for the fall of man and the introduction of evil into the world. All right. Who made the snake? Don't blame my little snake. They made the woman. Was it woman's fault? The serpent beguiled her and she did eat. It was a snake's fault. Why didn't you make him a nice little dog? A man's best friend is his snake. Oh, dear. This seventh day and half gone a bit, isn't it? Too right. What are you doing? Oh, it's just a picture. I'm a Sunday painter. What is it? Uh, it's the creation of Adam. Oh, it's not a very good likeness. Where is the turning point? The age of desperation? When all our opinions become more convincing than before. When we know what is right, because we cannot see alternatives, and we know we shall lose all if we doubt ourselves. What is objectivity? Keeping true perspective? We know things change when seen from different angles. Still, we play the game, knowing it takes time. Today's truth is qualified by tomorrow's contradiction. Still, we believe in ourselves, as we did yesterday. All men, it seems, have egos huge enough in which to hide themselves. So we leave room for forgiveness. This vision of perfection, the illusion of a purpose, is just a turning point. The age of desperation! Well, uh, let's see if we can go and rejoin our camera. Oh, there it is. Uh, well, it, it, it seems to be resting. Good. Uh, ah. Well, uh, it seems to have uh, found uh, staff near Sutton. So, <laughs> as you can see, it, it's in uh, good um, <clears throat> medical hands. Um, well, uh, perhaps we'll uh, rejoin the camera after. After. Uh, um. <laughs> yes. Well, let's see what's on next week. Coming shortly on Rutland Weekend, a new dramatisation of one of the world's longest books. Malicious Glimpf has taken Leo Tolstoy's very long story, War and Peace, and turned it into a very long television series. Set in the elaborate and extremely long world of 19th century Russia, it tells at great length the story of people caught up in the monumental and long Napoleonic Wars. Filmed expensively on location in Rutland, you can see the might and majesty and length of the French army as it advances on Moscow. Led by one of the greatest emperors equity has ever produced. Emmanuel Griffin plays Napoleon for all he's worth. It tells, too, the simple and moving tale 
of a pretty girl in love with a puffy actor. Natasha, torn between her love of close-ups and overacting. This classic love story unfolds amid some of history's most expensive and long scenes. See Moscow in flames. And watch the appalling horrors of the acting in the retreat from the burning city. All this to the noisy music of Tchaikovsky on Rutland Weekend's classically long series, War and Peace. Well, let's see if we can catch up on our documentary. Oh dear. Um, no. Well, uh, the camera's still away. So, uh, hey, come back! Of course, things have changed an awful lot since the old days. Oh, they have. I remember when you could post a letter and still have change out of a pound. Really? Mm. Well, you won't believe this, but you could fly to New York, you could have lunch, a bottle of champagne, go and see a Broadway show, fly back from New York, taxi from the airport, and still get change from a thousand quid. No. It's true. When was that? Last Wednesday. Last Wednesday? Oh, I remember last Wednesday. I could go and fill the car up with petrol and still have ten pounds change out of a three hundred pound note. Really? Hmm. Do you recognise that? Oh, that's a five pound note. I haven't seen one of those for ages. Collector's item. Oh, I remember those. What can you get for them now? Precious little. Oh, I remember when for five pounds you could get a whole round of toast and have salt on it. Really? Buttered toast? Well, no. Oh. Well, I remember when for ten pounds you could go to America, settle down, have pick of all the women or whatever, and you could still have enough money left to start a business. Ten pounds? Really, yes. When was that? Uh, 1747. 1747? Ten pounds? That's outrageous. Yes, that's what he says it's going to cost now to sail to America. Well, I remember when for ten pounds you could sail to the West Indies, buy an entire crew of slaves, as much rum as you needed, as much tobacco as you wanted, provisions for an entire year, and still have several hundred guineas change. When was that? 1593. 1593? Ten pounds for all of this, Sir Walter. Yeah, that's that's right, Your Majesty. Yeah. It's very good. What is it? Well, we're going to call it tobacco. You know, just to uh, just to keep it cool. Gee, it's good stuff. Yeah, that's Virginia Red. And you got this off the Indians? Yeah, that's right, man. <laughs> I don't think you should call your sovereign man, man, <laughs> especially when she's a woman. Oh. Sorry. Do you think you could get me some more of this? Tobacco? Yeah, all right, Your Majesty. I'll see if I can school you a little. Hey, you come back at once. Come on. You cheeky monkey. Wednesday sees the welcome return of That's My Mum, when Michael's guests will be Mrs Oscar Wilde, D.H. Lawrence's mum, and the mummy of the Marquis de Sade. <laughs> Yes, dear Oscar, you're such a jolly little boy, always playing with other little boys. How interesting. Did you ever imagine that when he grew up he would write just great classics for the stage? Well, no, never. Oh, except once when he was ten years old, he said to me, Mum, you know, when I grow up, I think I'm going to write the importance of being earnest. But apart from that, there was no indication. How interesting. Mrs. Lawrence, you're D.H.'s mother. Yes, that's right. What did the D.H. stand for? I don't know. You don't know? No, I never asked him. I, I didn't like to pry into his private life, what with him being artistic and all. I think he might have got it from D.H. Evans, because he used to get his writing trousers from there. You know he had special trousers to write in, don't you? How interesting. Uh, Mrs. Desard, your boy. Marquis, yes. Yes. What sort of a child? Quite boisterous. Well, you can find out more about Mrs. Desard's little boy Marquis and also Mrs. Wilde's Oscar and Mrs. Lawrence's D.H. on That's My Mum on Wednesday. Promised later in the series, Mrs. Hitler talking about baby Adolf and Leonard Bernstein's Auntie Betty. Meanwhile, Rutland Weekend Television is closing down now. Please remember to switch off your sets, unless, of course, you don't want to. Yeah.